I'm Deanne Erdman with Baylor College of Medicine's Option Program. This presentation is part of a review in preparation for the Life Science Teacher Certification Exam. Part C is an introduction to animal behavior. In the past two decades, the study of animal behavior has emerged as an important and diverse science, encompassing evolution, ecology, physiology, genetics. We define behavior as the way an organism reacts to changes or stimuluses in its external and its internal environment. It might be something simple like just the response to an odor or more complicated by the fact that it's influenced by both genetics and the environment. It's also difficult not to judge, human, uh, not to judge behavior from a human standpoint in our own experiences. So we ask when we're dealing with animal behavior, um, how it's triggered, how it's controlled, how it's performed. An example I might give you is when a ma uh, some male birds sing, they uh, sing in, re in response or they're trying to find and attract a mate, but it's really because of a buildup of testosterone levels inside the bird. Those testosterone levels in turn could be triggered by uh, the environment, by the changes in day or le uh, the, the length of day or night. Uh, or also in temperature changes. So it's sometimes a lot more complicated than it might appear just on the surface. Usually the influence on survival and reproduction answers the question of why the behavior exists. If behavior has both environmental and genetic influences, then what do we mean by innate or how do we separate, separate out innate or instinctive behavior? And one of the measures that we use when we're talking about instinctive behavior is that does the, does the behavior change significantly in a different range of environments. Also, we look at how important it would be for this particular behavior to be performed perfectly the first time uh, and relate that to the chances of survival for that organism. So fully functional the first time is, is a good um, measure of innate behavior. So there can be some improvement, but sometimes that improvement is just physical maturation. An example I can think of is uh, uh, birds learning, we say birds learning to fly, and you see a baby bird or a fledgling leaving for the first time. Uh, the nest and they're a little bit awkward in that uh, process. They kind of flap to the ground, they rest uh, before they start attempting to hop from tree to tree or do short little flights. Well there was an experiment done where um, birds were kept in a cage and their wings were tied so that they couldn't practice until they were more mature and when they were released they were able to fly normally. So in this particular case it's not really learning to fly it's a, as much as it is the physical maturation of the muscles and the, the neural connections. Some other examples of innate behavior, uh, nest building in birds is just very distinctive from species to species, uh, newborn suckling, or even web building in spiders. Uh, you may not realize it, but spiders build very distinctive kinds of webs and obviously uh, when the, f the female spider laid the egg she took off so she's not around to teach them this skill so this is an instinctive behavior that they automatically know. Learned behavior is acquired um, or modified by s specific experiences not just maturing um, as like we were talking about with the, with the bird flight a minute ago. So let's look at a few examples. Habituation is a type of behavior that sometimes I refer to as the, the cry wolf behavior. Um, eventually, uh, because this behavior doesn't have any kind of reward or, or punishment, no real significance to the organism, it just sort of tunes it out and ignores it. When you think about the barrage of signals that are coming in not only internally but externally uh, from your environment, if an organism was aware of all of those, just wouldn't be able to, uh, to, to focus in on any one activity. So a number of signals that, that aren't important to survival are just filtered out, and this is called habituation. Associative behavior, I, I, I want to talk about two, uh, classic, uh, two different kinds of associative behavior, and one is classical association, and uh, what always comes to mind is Ivan Pavlov's study with dogs. And what he did was to spray a meat powder into a dog's mouth, which caused it to salivate, but at the same time he rang a bell. 
It wasn't very long at all before the dog learned to associate the ringing of the bell with the, uh, with the meat uh, uh, taste and would salivate just with the ringing of the bell and not the meat at all. <clears throat> Probably a lot of you have had that same experience with your own pets at home. You can rattle a food sack or maybe there's a particular um, series of events that triggers and the dog knows that they're getting to, to eat or maybe even go for a walk. You can jingle that leash. Uh, another type of associative behavior is, uh, is uh, operant uh, conditioning. This is trial and error learning. And uh, one of the, of course, most classic examples of this kind of behavior was done by B.F. Skinner in the 30s with his work with rats and where they quickly learned to depress different colored levers um, for, uh, to receive a reward like food. And uh, they learned not to depress a certain lever that might give them a mild electrical shock. And so that's a type of associating one kind of behavior with another. Insight and reasoning, uh, it, when we talk about this kind of behavior, that's applying um, uh, past experience to a new experience. And two examples that I can give you for, for, to understand this particular kind of behavior is an experiment that was done with chimpanzees. And uh, they were put into a cage and um, with a, a, a series of different sized boxes all scattered about the, the cage at random. And bananas were suspended from a wire um, but uh, from the top of the cage but out of the chimpanzee's reach. And uh, time and time again, the chimpanzees, different uh, um, individuals each time, uh, figured out how to stack the boxes in such a way that they could climb up on them and reach those bananas. Uh, another interesting study done by Bernard Heinrich was done with ravens. And what he did was to take a piece of meat and suspend it from a string from a twig, which of course the raven couldn't reach. And it wasn't long before the ravens learned to solve the problem, and some of them in different ways, but one of the, the most interesting ways was that the raven took its foot and pulled the string a little closer and anchored it, and then alternated, took the other foot, pulled the string a little closer still, and anchored it until finally it had worked the string all the way up with the meat on it where it got its reward. And not only did one or two ravens figure this out, but they were able to pass that learning on to other ravens in other cages that hadn't necessarily witnessed the original raven figuring out this process. So we do have lots of evidence of different organisms being able to reason and to have some insight into solving a, a, a problem. Imprinting is another very interesting kind of behavior, and this uh, once again shows how closely instinct and learning are related to one another because there's a, a very narrow window of opportunity for an organism to learn a particular behavior. And Conrad Lorentz, a Nobel laureate that worked uh, uh, with animal behavior, uh, is famous for his work with the gray lag goose. And um, he noticed that the, uh, the hatchlings seemed to focus in on the first moving object that they saw when they hatched. So he incubated eggs and he replaced himself as the mother as the first moving object when the hatchlings uh, broke out of their shell and they um, attached to him as the mother goose. And even when he tried to reintroduce them at a later time to the original parent, they still stayed with him. He, w he was their mother for life. Let's look at survival and reproduction in terms of patterns of behavior and how that contributes to success in organisms. And uh, for, for example, in courtship, uh, most courtship r rituals, what they do is they help other, they help organisms identify members of their own species so that they can successfully mate and reproduce. Uh, on a summer evening um, or after a big rain, you'll hear a lot of, of noise coming from frogs, and that's all the male frogs, by the way. They, uh, they're the only ones with vocal sacs. And what they're doing is attracting a female to some body of water usually because they're an amphibian and they need the water to reproduce. And the female can discern the, the call of, the, of the, the bullfrog that's specific to her species and ignore the other ones. Uh, fireflies, I think, are kind of interesting, which, by the way, are really beetles, and there's a, a number of different species. And they emit flashes of light in a process called bioluminescence, and they fly in a very species-specific pattern and emit the light in a very species specific uh, pattern as well and so that, that each uh, member, the male and the female, can locate each other for reproduction. 
Parental care uh, it, it is another interesting behavior. Uh, most of the time, parental care is invested with the female. And because she has a limited number of eggs, she's much more likely to be selective in the mate that she actually chooses because she, she's going to spend and invest more time in the, in the care of her offspring, and so she'll be more selective. The male, on the other hand, uh, invests his energy better by uh, trying to reproduce with a large number of females, and that ensures his reproductive success. Uh, another thing to look at when you're looking at reproduction is the size of the, uh, the, or the number of offspring that are produced at any one time. And remember that, that a lot of things in nature are about maximizing your return for your, for your energy output. And so an insect, for example, may spend a lot of energy laying a number of eggs, but practically no time in, in parental involvement. Um, so that's why they have to lay so many eggs because not so many of them are going to survive. But a bird, on the other hand, maybe only lays a clutch of four or five eggs, but they're going to it. So they invested less time in the reproductive process, but they're going to spend a lot more time in raising that um, those organisms, and they'll have a, a higher uh, uh, reproductive or survival s success rate. Defensive behaviors: um, these are protection of individuals, of mates, of offspring, territory. Foraging, this primarily uh, focuses on finding prey. And again, you're looking at mac maximizing the, r the return of energy you get for the amount of energy you expend in uh, obtaining that prey. An example I might give you is uh, shore crabs. Um, there are some species of shore crabs that, that feed on mussels. And the shore crab would, would choose uh, a, a medium-sized muscle over a large muscle because the large one takes so much energy to get open that it doesn't net as much return in energy when it feeds on that muscle as it does when it opens a smaller one, which is much easier for it to get open. Um, even deer, uh, interestingly enough, can sense chemicals in plants and determine the nutritive value and spend their time and energy feeding on uh, the plants that have a higher nutritional value than a lower nutritional value, as well as um, uh, sensing chemicals in plants that are dangerous and would not be uh, a good thing for the deer to feed on. Territorial behavior uh, is usually based on some kind of a limiting factor, whether it be mates or food um, uh, or uh, reproductive areas. Periodic or cyclic behavior, uh, we think of circadian ry rhythms that revolve around a 24-hour period uh, of, of time, and then changes in the, the length of day uh, versus night. And sometimes these signal organisms to put on extra body, heat, uh, body fat in preparation for winter or to store um, more little caches of food around an area because food's getting ready to be uh, scarce, or in some cases it brings on uh, the production of hormones and reproductive cycles. Um, temperature also it influences a lot of the periodic or cyclic uh, behaviors. Migration is such an interesting uh, topic, and, and you're going to find your students always uh, like to talk about that. And migration's pretty well worked out in birds. That's been pretty well studied. Studied. We still have um, a lot of questions about how turtles are able to to migrate, how um, monarch butter butterflies, for example, uh, migrate as well. But in birds, um, with the migration, we, we see several different patterns. In piloting um, type of migration, it's just picking up by different uh, landmarks. And uh, you, can, uh, exib you, you can demonstrate this by, uh, in different species by moving the landmarks, and you find that they don't end up uh, uh, arriving at the correct location because uh, the landmark's been moved. A little bit more sophisticated is orientation, and uh, the bird is able to use co uh, compass directions, but still flies in, in straight line path. So in this particular kind of organism, if it were blown off course, for example, it wouldn't arrive in its final destination, uh, uh, original de destination, because it had been blown off course and it would still be flying in that straight line path. And then the most sophisticated kind of migration is navigation, where with uh, use of stars and sun and magnetic field, um, and uh, it's able to calculate its present location 
and using compass directions lo adjust it so that they do end up in their original final destination. So it's a fairly fascinating field of study. Oh, I think I think one of the ones that's most intriguing to me is the monarch butterfly. The, uh, and let's take the, the eastern species. It migrates from to and from Mexico to the eastern coast, but it's not the same generation of butterflies that leave and arrive. Sometimes it can be two to five different generations that have been reproduced and matured and continue the journey, but they arrive in the, the, the exact correct location. And so the, the communication of how that's passed on is, is an area of, of interest to scientists and um, an ongoing study. Transmission and reception of uh, and response to signals is what we call communication. And uh, these signals cause changes in behavior. And they could be visual, they could be auditory, they could be tactile, they could be even chemical. So let's look at a few of these examples. Pheromones are, are, are chemicals that are um, that em emitted by uh, different kinds of organisms. You can think of bees. Bees use pheromones to establish rank. Uh, as to whether they're feeding and taking care of the larvae nursery workers or whether they're, they're out providing defense for the, the hive or they're um, uh, collecting food. Ants mark a trail with uh, pheromones to a food source so that other members of the colony can find that food source. And all of these organisms use um, pheromones as alarms. Uh, just go up and touch an ant pile just barely with a little tiny stick and you'll see how quickly those pheromones can be communicated from a one organism to the other and they can be out to see what's going on and defend uh, the colony. Uh, Nobel laureate uh, Carl von Frisch um, worked with um, the honeybee and it, it, the, he named, uh, he, he worked with how are honeybees able to communicate where a food source is and what he discovered was that they do a particular series of movements on the side of the hive which he described as the figure eight or waggle dance. And when the bees, when a bee say has found a, a really good food source, it comes back, it has that pollen uh, as a little sample, but it will also do uh, a figure eight dance on the side of the hive and the direction that it orients the, the, uh, um, the figure eight on the side of the hive and the speed at which it goes around and travels in this figure eight pattern and the number of waggles to its abdomen will indicate the direction, the distance of that uh, particular food source. And, and it's even more complicated in that from the time that, that this bee first discovered the food source, comes back to the hive, and then others go back out, the sun angles have changed and the, and the time of day has changed. So it's a fairly complicated and sophisticated kind of communication. Bird songs uh, are used to uh, attract and recognize uh, mates. Uh, another visual signal is that from the kill deer. And uh, what the kill deer, a, a particular species of bird, it will do, if a predator gets too close to its nest, she will fly away and flutter on the ground with, uh, and act like she has a broken wing, like she's you know, sort of a sitting duck for a predator. And as the predator approaches, then she flies away. But in the meantime, she's distracted it away from uh, her offspring. So that's a form of communication. Uh, another for, uh, visual d display is that of the stickleback fish. Uh, another Nobel laureate, Nico Timbergen, worked with uh, stickleback fish. And what they have, the male during breeding season develops a red underbelly. And if another male enters or comes close, just the side of that red underbelly will um, spark defensive, aggressive behaviors and he'll run the other guy off. But a female is attracted to this red belly, so that's the first visual s display. And when, she, and when she's ready to reproduce, she will adopt a head up posture, a second visual display, which causes the male to then do a zigzag swimming motion, which is the third visual display. He leads her to his nest, she deposits the eggs, and then he fertilizes them. So it's a pretty complicated series of visual uh, uh, maneuvers to accomplish reproduction. Do animals process information and respond in a manner to suggest thinking? Um, when you think about some of the problem solving the uh, abilities of animals or you think about some of your own experiences, sometimes I think maybe uh, my dog has higher cognitive abilities than I do because she has me pretty well trained. 
But when uh, when cognitive pathologists uh, uh, look at organisms, they talk about uh, mental experiences because they're open to the idea that some animals may have an awareness or a consciousness of themselves. And in the study of mental experiment, uh, experiences of animals, uh, we look at how they find food, how they rear their young, um, avoid predators, create shelters, communicate, and socialize. And it's an interesting area, but of course, you know, obviously, you, you can tell from uh, the topic that there's a lot of controversy and a lot of uh, disagreement about whether animals truly have these mental experiences as we do. And I think that's one of the difficult things about studying behavior is because we tend to humanize uh, some animal behaviors when uh, they have a totally different kind of origin. This concludes a uh, brief review of animal behavior, and you can find additional information on uh, this particular section in the expanded content talks and also in the notes below the slide. Thank you.